This is a brand new 2018 Range Rover Velar. The sticker price on this one was around $86,000, which is a lot of money. But then again, this is the coolest Range Rover ever. And today, I'm going to show you why. If you haven't been paying attention in the world of luxury SUVs, you might be thinking, the Range Rover what now? Another Land Rover? And yes, they have a lot of models. There's the Range Rover Evoque, and then the Range Rover Velar, and then the Range Rover Sport, and then the full-size regular Range Rover, and then there's the Land Rover Discovery and the Land Rover Discovery Sport, which are two different vehicles. But the Velar is the coolest one of them all. It's designed to slot between the smaller Evoque and the more practical Range Rover Sport in Land Rover's lineup, and I think it's supposed to rival those weird, ugly coupe SUVs. SUVs like the BMW X6 and the Mercedes-Benz GLE Coupe. But rather than follow that stupid coupe SUV trend, Land Rover gave us this, which is far more attractive. In fact, I happen to think that this is one of the most beautiful Land Rover models ever made. But like I said before, it isn't cheap. Now, the Velar starts around $58,000 with shipping, but this one has virtually every single option. And as I mentioned, the sticker price on this one was just a shade over $86 thousand dollars. The ones I'm seeing at my dealer equipped normally with all the regular options are somewhere between 70 and 80 thousand dollars and that is a lot of money for cool. But today I've borrowed this Velar from a viewer in Northern Virginia and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features in the rain that make this thing so cool and so enticing. And then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Velar click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the coolest older Land Rover models currently listed for sale on AutoTrader. Now I'm going to start on the outside where you probably noticed in some of those intro shots that the door handles are sticking out like big ugly ears. They look kind of weird. Well that's because the car is unlocked and the doors are ready to open. If I close the door and lock it, the door handles slide back into the door so that they can be flush with the car to preserve its styling. And since we're talking about the doors and locking, we might as well now discuss the Land Rover Activity Key, which is a neat little trick. Now here's how this works. Let's say I'm going to go swimming. Now, if I'm going to go swimming, I don't want to take my car key with me because obviously it's electronic and if I get in the water, that'll screw it up. The Land Rover Activity Key allows me to leave my key behind. I put my Land Rover key inside the cargo area. I close the cargo area. And then I have this. This is a waterproof little rubberized thing I can wear on my wrist like a watch. I walk up to the back of the car. I place it here. And as you can see, the lights just flash. Now the car is locked. I put this on my wrist and then I can go swimming or play basketball or whatever. And I don't have to worry about my key because it's locked inside the car. All right, so now let's say I finished with my swimming. I come back to my Velar and I want to get back in and turn it on and drive away after my workout, whatever. I walk up to the car with the activity key. I press this little button under the tailgate to activate it so it knows that I'm coming. I hold the activity key up to the tailgate again. You can see it just unlocked. Now I open it back up and I got my key again. And that way I don't have to actually bring my key with me if I'm going to go do some sort of activity. Hence the name Land Rover Activity Key. This is a brilliant idea. Now, since I'm around back, I also want to talk about a couple of the cool style features of this car, one of which is the taillights. Not only do they look cool when they're off, just in their sort of regular position, but look at them when they're on. It's like several layers of taillight. It looks cool and futuristic. I also love the fact that the rear wiper doesn't appear anywhere on here when you look at the back of the Velar. The rear end is not cluttered by a wiper. That's because the rear wiper is hidden under here, and you won't see it unless it's on. This is a Range Rover hallmark. My Range Rover is like this, and it's a really good piece of design that sort of lets the back end have its natural look without the ugliness of the wiper. Moving up to the front, another cool Velar detail is in the headlights. Now, it's generally agreed that Land Rover has some of the coolest looking LED running lights. They've really taken the LED game to a whole new level. But up until now, in previous Land Rover models, when you turn on the turn signal, the entire LED running light would turn off, and it was kind of unfortunate. No longer in the Velar. Now in the Velar, when you put on the turn signal, the running light generally stays 
on, only a small part of it turns orange. And so the car preserves its sort of aggressive look with those LED running lights, even when the turn signal is on. Now, as I've mentioned, and as you can probably tell from watching this, I really like the way the Velar looks on the outside, but there is one exterior detail on this car that I don't really like, and that would be the fuel door. The Velar has all these aggressive lines and sharp edges, and it looks modern and cool and excellent. And, and then there's this lazy oval-shaped fuel door that looks like it's out of a 78 Ford Granada. It's almost like Land Rover was like, oh, we can't make it perfect. We, we have to stop. We have to make something ugly. I've got it. The fuel door. Oh, what a great idea. Dear Giles, oh thank you, Alistair, let's go to the pub. And then this is the result of that conversation. Anyway, one more cool exterior quirk before we move inside. That would be right here. Watch this space while I open the doors. Look at this. Land Rover has actually put a little Velar emblem in the B pillar between the front door opening and the rear door opening. Most people will probably never notice this, but I noticed that it's on both sides and it, it really looks cool. I mean, it's this cool little medallion you see every time you get in the car, if you happen to see it. Next up, climbing inside the Velar, where you quickly realize that the coolest thing about this car is not how it looks or the fact that it's the hot new Range Rover, but rather the center screen setup. Get ready for a tour of one of the coolest, most futuristic center screens in the entire car industry. First off, there are three screens, one in the gauge cluster, one in the middle, and another one below the middle one that takes the place of your usual center control buttons. There's just one single button in the center of everything. Everything else is all screen. And so we start with the most interesting screen, which is the one that used to be buttons. Here's the climate tab, and you can see you tap the screen to adjust where the air comes out. You can choose your head or your legs or your passenger's head or legs or whatever. But the coolest part is down here. You want to make it warmer or cooler. You use these cool rotary dials that adjust the temperature, and the temperature is displayed inside them. That's neat, but check this out. Say you now want to turn on your heated seat. Push the rotary dial. And now it's the heated seat control. Turn it to the right or left to make your seat warmer or cooler. Push it again and it becomes the temperature control again. And if you turn on the seat and then go back to the climate control temperature, little dots appear above the temperature to remind you that your seat is on. The climate tab also lets you adjust the rear climate control and it even lets you lock the rear climate control so backseat passengers can't make their own adjustments. Finally, the climate control tab includes an image of Pac-Man eating a pellet. I have no idea what this does. Next up, we move on to the Seats tab, and you have a few options. Right now, the seat is on the massage setting, so the rotary dials let you turn up or down the seat massage. But turn it over to Seating Climate Control, and once again, you can adjust whether you want your seat heated or cooled. Next up is the Middle tab, which lets you control the stereo. It also lets you set up your phone using Bluetooth, and I think this picture Land Rover uses is totally hilarious. A British phone booth to emphasize that Land Rover is British, and it's placed in the wilds to remind you that Land Rover is rugged. Anyway, next you go into settings and you can choose some interesting climate settings. For example, you can choose the type of air that blows into the cabin. Do you want it soft and quiet or powerful and fast or maybe balanced for comfort? Finally, we have to discuss the vehicle tab, which is cool. You get this really high quality image and now the rotary dial has become a method to change the drive mode. You start in dynamic for road use, then there's eco and the bottom of the Velar turns green. Next up is comfort and you get a different different Velar image, then there's grass, gravel, snow, and it's driving through well, I don't really know what that is. Then there's mud ruts, and you're driving through mud ruts. And finally, there's sand for all those times when you're traversing sand dunes in your Velar. Next up, we have the upper screen. Although it isn't quite as crazy or as configurable as the lower one, it houses the cameras, which are insane. By now, every luxury car has front and rear and 360 degree cameras, but the Velar also has side cameras that monitor the wheels. Watch as you can actually see the wheels turn while I turn the steering wheel. I guess the theory here is is this camera ensures you won't scrape your wheel in a tight parking space, and it also lets you see what you're going to run over off-road. Of course, this whole thing is also configurable, so you can display whatever cameras you want whenever you want to see them. Finally, we get to screen number three, the gauge cluster screen, where the default setting is two gauges, and an image of the Velar, so you can see how attractive your car is at all times. One thing I love about this screen is how incredibly configurable it is. You can have two dials showing speed and engine speed, revs, or you can have a full map, or you can have a full map in one dial. And check this out, if you have a full map, it really is a full map taking up the entire gauge cluster while you're driving down the street. 
But the coolest thing about the gauge cluster screen is how you adjust it. Watch this. Right now, you can use the steering wheel control to adjust stereo volume or change the track. But if you press menu, the steering wheel control changes right before your eyes. The old display is gone, and now there's a new one that lets you scroll through the menus. Watch that again. It changes based on what's on the gauge cluster screen, which is so cool. Best of all, it's even capacitive touch. You don't even have to press it. As I slide my thumb over it, listen, and you can hear the radio volume changing without me pushing anything. I'm just sliding. Now, maybe the most bizarre things in these center screens happen when you go into the settings menu in the upper screen. There are a couple of odd quirks in here. I'm going to start with the screen angle setting. Even though the screen is sitting right here and you could just manually adjust it, you can't. You got to push these minus and plus buttons for screen angle and then it automatically adjusts as you press the buttons. It's incredibly responsive, but I mean, <laughs> do we really need technology for this feature? For the next interesting quirk in the infotainment settings, go into the legal information tab and it tells you how to write to Jaguar Land Rover in order to get the source code for the infotainment system. That's not all that unusual. Most cars have that. The weird thing is the email address they give so that you can write to them. It's F-R-E-Q-U-E-S-1 at JaguarLandRover.com. Did they really need the one? They own the domain. Couldn't it just be F-R-E-Q-U-E-S? Next thing you know, they'll be putting in F-R-E-Q-U-E-S 420 at jaguarlandover.com. <laughs> The next thing I like is the infotainment system gives you the opportunity to choose a wallpaper background, which is very nice. And in fact, it gives you quite a few. There are six on the first page, and then there are six on the second page. Although if you look at them, you'll notice that they're pretty much all the same. They're just sort of white with little wavy lines in them. So even though you have the opportunity to choose between 12 different wallpapers, you really don't have the opportunity to choose between any different wallpapers. Next up, maybe my favorite settings quirk, that would be in the navigation system settings. You have the opportunity to choose which types of places you want displayed on the navigation system as you're driving around. So you look down, you see, for example, a police station or a sports venue or a parking lot. There's also on there, there's religious places. That is the most politically correct term. Can you imagine the meetings in Jaguar Land Rover? Oh, I can't call it churches. That'll People get mad. I can't call it synagogues. And mosque won't work. I've got it. Religious places. Also, on that screen, are the people for public bathroom holding hands? I know there's some politics to this whole gender bathroom thing, but I don't think anybody's advocating that you should be holding hands in the bathroom. What exactly does Jaguar Land Rover think is going on in a public bathroom? With all that said about the screens, and I really like them, the reality is this is still a Land Rover, and this happened during the day I spent with the Velar. The screens completely froze and nothing could turn back on. Even turning the car off three times and restarting it didn't work. In the end, I had to turn off the Velar, walk away for a few minutes, and then come back. And they worked perfectly fine for the rest of the day. So that's a lot of tech stuff, but that isn't the only thing in the Velar's interior that makes it cool. This is also an absolutely beautiful interior. It's tremendously nice, incredibly well done, and I love these colors, these white seats with this black trim and this white stitching. It's gorgeous. With that said, this particular Velar is a lease. It's being leased by the guy who let me borrow it, and I think he's gonna be really happy that he leased it and he didn't buy it. Check out the wear on these seats. This car has only 4,400 miles on it, and look how much blue from jeans and stuff has already gotten onto these white seats. They might be gorgeous just but they're certainly wearing quickly and as nice as this interior is I wouldn't necessarily want to own it long term but anyway a couple of items worth noting about the interior and the trim take a closer look at those seats and you look past the blue and you'll notice that the little dots in the seats are arranged to form the Union Jack the British flag they're in there the owner didn't even realize that they had that arrangement but they do if you look closely Land Rover is always trying to tie into its British heritage the other cool trim thing in the interior that I love is the steering wheel it is one of the most gorgeous steering wheels I've seen it's white on the inside black on the outside and then there's this silver rim in the middle the whole thing looks like the kind of steering wheel you'd get from a Bentley except even Bentley steering wheels aren't this nice oh and by the way that same Union Jack pattern in the seats is also included in the stereo speakers on the door although it's a bit harder to see on those speakers it's there if you look close enough 
One odd item in the Velar is the way you turn on the headlights, which I really don't like. This car has the headlights at the end of the turn signal stock like a lot of cars do. You just flip the end of the stock and they turn on. But the weird thing is, after it turns on, it then goes back to the middle position. So you never really know if your lights are on or not unless you sort of look in the gauge cluster and see the symbol they use to let you know. I don't know why it just doesn't have the little switch at the end of the turn signal stock simply stay in the position that you put it in like every single other car in history, but everybody wants wants to reinvent the wheel, apparently including Land Rover with simply turning on the headlights. Next up, moving on to the center console, which is rather odd. I say this because the center console lid is also the armrest for the driver and the passenger, and it's split into two. So there's the driver armrest and the passenger armrest, and they're both the center console lid, meaning if you want to get into the center console, you have to open both lids. But that also means that if the passenger is sitting here with their arm on the armrest like this, the driver can still open the center console on the driver's side armrest. They just can't necessarily get to everything. They have to slide their hand in there pretty far, meaning that you could open the center console while using the armrest, which is a, a nice little interesting quirk. Also interesting in the Velar, the center console is normally flat. When you push the start button to start it, the gear selector rises out of the center console so you can twist it and put it in gear. This has been common in Jaguar and Land Rover models for a while, but it is really cool if you haven't seen it yet. Next up, moving on to the glove box and specifically the owner's manual pouch. There's nothing particularly unusual in here, but there are a couple of quirks. For example, Land Rover gives you Land Rover approved cloths to wipe down your multiple screens. Given the screen situation in this car, I suspect those will come in handy. Next up, the owner's manual itself. Now the owner's manual of this car is pretty straightforward, albeit massive, um, but I always like to highlight at least one little quirk from the owner's manual of each car. And this one would be the smart key transmitter location. That's page 385. If you look at the smart key transmitter locations, you'll notice they're everywhere. They read your key so you can unlock the doors without having to take the key out of your pocket. And there's six of them, and they appear in pretty much every single place throughout the car. The doors, the roof, the tailgate, the windshield, whatever. That's not all that interesting. I suspect that's pretty common. But the interesting part is it says, warning, any person fitted with an implanted medical device should make sure the device is kept at least 8.7 inches away from any transmitter. Well, they're in the doors, they're in the roof. How could you possibly keep your medical device 8.7 inches away? <laughs> You're not driving a Velar, apparently, if you've got an implanted medical device. Next up, moving on to the back seats of the Velar. A couple of interesting things back here, one of which is that even the rear seats have a screen. It's for the climate control and it's capacitive touch. You just tap it and then it does what you tell it to, auto or increase the fan speed. There's even different zones. And the rear passengers can also control the climate temperature with those little dials, just like you saw the ones up in the front. Also interesting, if you look at that area with the screen and the climate control vents in sort of the rear seat center console area, you'll notice there are no USB ports back there for charging, which is kind of a drag. Backseat passengers want to charge their stuff too. Well, it turns out that those ports are hidden within the top of the rear center armrest. When you put it down, then those ports become visible and you can charge. That means you can't charge if you have someone in the middle seat, but nonetheless, they're there. One thing that isn't normal back here, take a close look at the seatbelt. You'll notice that printed on them is a QR code. The front seat belts don't have them. Only the rear ones do, but all of the rear seat belts have them. It's odd. I wonder why I've never seen a QR code before on a seat belt. Oh yeah, that's right, because no one's ever going to scan it. It's such a bizarre placement that I almost wonder if it's something having to do with production, that the QR code is in there when they're building the car, they know when to put the seatbelt where or whatever. Next up, moving on to the cargo area. I've got my backpack in here for scale or maybe I just don't want to move my backpack. But either way, you can tell with the backpack in here, this is a pretty decent sized cargo area. In fact, it looks fairly normal for this size of SUV, and it's a lot bigger than what you'd get in one of those weird coupe back SUVs with the sloped roof. For something this stylish and cool, it actually has a lot of practicality back here. And there are a couple of interesting quirks inside the cargo area, one of which is that you can lower this car's load floor. So you're walking up to the cargo area, you got something really heavy, you can't quite get it over the bumper, that's okay. Press this little button on the side of the cargo area, and then the Velar will actually drop in back by a couple of inches to make it just that much easier to load your cargo into the cargo area. That's made possible because this thing has air suspension, which is adjustable. So when you're driving, you can adjust the height if you want to clear an obstacle off-road, but it also allows you to do that, which is really cool. Now, in the back of the Velar, there's no way to power fold the rear seats like some cars have. You push a button and they drop down, but all you got to do is pull a latch and the 
same thing happens. They drop down and you can lower them all to get a nice flat load floor for even more practicality. The other interesting thing in the back of the Velar, open up the floor and usually you'll find like a space saver spare tire, an air compressor, some tools and this thing, you got a full-size spare with a full-size wheel, which means every Velar ships with five alloy wheels. If you ever check the price on an alloy wheel, it's like a thousand bucks to replace one, so that can't be cheap. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2018 Range Rover Velar. Now it's time to get behind the wheel and see how it drives. Now, in case you're curious, the base level Velar has a 247 horsepower turbocharged four-cylinder. There's also a diesel four-cylinder if you want better gas mileage. If you want better performance, there is a 380 horsepower supercharged V6, and that's the engine in this one. Unfortunately, after 250 some videos of doing this, for the first time ever, my camera recorded only the audio of my drive and not the video. So I listened to the audio and I'm going to kind of sum it up for you now. And I'm going to show you images of the Velar as I do. and you could pretend that I'm driving. Now, I want to start off by sort of giving my own bias here. I'm a big Land Rover fan. Uh, I've had three of them, and I have two right now, a 2006 Range Rover and a 1997 Defender. So maybe I'm a little biased in my opinion of this car, but Land Rover fans like me have kind of been skeptical of all of these new Land Rover models. Do they really need another one, we all keep thinking? So that's sort of where I'm coming from. Now, with that said, getting behind the wheel of this thing and driving it, I was really, really impressed primarily with the driving dynamics. This thing handles incredibly well. The steering is just a little bit on the vague side, but the handling is great. It's so balanced. There's very little body roll. It's incredibly predictable, and it was almost fun throwing it around corners. I got to drive it on some great back roads in Virginia, and it was just a blast. It was really, really fun to drive. So many modern cars are now turbocharged, and they're a little bit peaky, the engines, but the supercharged V6 just feels smooth and fast, and it was just wonderful. It really was. Handling was on par with the Maserati Levante, which I consider to be sort of the darling of this segment. In fact, I think it maybe was even a little bit better than the Porsche Cayenne. Of course, that's the old Cayenne. The new one is supposedly coming pretty soon. The thing just drove really well, which I absolutely was not expecting from a Range Rover and from like the seventh model in their lineup. And I was just like, eh, is this just sort of a cynical attempt to gain more sales? Well, actually, no, it's a pretty good car and it's a pretty fun car to drive. The transmission was smooth. It wasn't quite as quick as I was kind of hoping for. It's not as quick as a dual clutch, but they don't use dual clutches apparently because they can't tow as much. So it's a traditional torque converter. It's smooth, it's quick. If you're looking for any sort of performance from an SUV, this is absolutely up there with the very best, short of the like performance SUVs like the X5M or you know the Cayenne Turbo S, cars that cost way more money basically. Visibility is pretty good. Uh, it's much better than those squatty coupe back things. Over the shoulder is a little bit tough because the window line sort of narrows as you go down the car, but nonetheless, it's decent, but I think the real takeaway here is that it just, the dynamics were so good. It felt even sportier than the F-Pace I drove, which has sort of like the same platform and the same powertrain. Maybe I'm just a little bit biased, but I really feel like it felt more exciting to drive than that car. And of course, the technology is significantly better than the F-Pace. So that's the 2018 Range Rover Velar. If you want practicality from your Range Rover, you would be advised to instead get the Range Rover Sport, which has a third row seat, a little more interior room, Room for about the same price. But this thing has gorgeous styling, it has a lot of incredible tech features, and it drives tremendously well. And it's far more attractive than the ugly X6 and the GLE Coupe. This thing is cool, and right now, you're cool if you have one. At least until the warranty runs out. And now it's time for the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Velar is gorgeous, truly handsome for an SUV, and it gets 7 out of 10. And by the way, based on your reaction to the Lincoln Navigator last week, I bumped that car's style score down to a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, the supercharged Velar does 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds, which gives it a 4 out of 10 on the Doug Score acceleration scale. Handling was a tough one. The Velar is really tight for an SUV, and in the end, I gave it a 6 out of 10, which is a really strong score for an SUV, but I really think it deserves it. Cool factor is reasonably high 
high for a car like this, especially right now as the Velar is really hot and it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, there's importance. The Velar is more significant than a boring run-of-the-mill Jetta or Camry, but it's no ultra sports car. It's right in the middle at a 5 out of 10. Added up in the total weekend score is 28 out of 50, which is pretty good for a Range Rover. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The Velar's center screens are highly impressive when they're working, and it easily earns a 9 out of 10. As for comfort, the Velar has nice seats and good ride quality, and it earns a 7 out of 10. Quality is a hard one. The Velar's interior is tremendously high quality, even beyond its price point, which isn't cheap. But I worry about long-term dependability of any Land Rover, and I mean, it broke during the few hours I was using it. I'm giving it just above average, a 6 out of 10, but I wouldn't want to own this thing out of warranty. Next up is practicality, and the cargo space is big. The Velar has 61 cubic feet, which is more than an X6 or the GLE Coupe, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, there's value. I think the Velar is a decent value, but the one I drove is pretty expensive for a midsize SUV with a V6. It gets a 6 out of 10, but I think a cheaper Velar could score a bit better here. Added up, and the total daily score is 36 out of 50, which is near the top, and it deserves it. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is 64 out of 100, which places it near the middle. Here's how it stacks up next to Rivals. It beats out the Levante and the F-Pace, though I think I personally would still rather have a Trackhawk or a Raptor, even though I realize most Land Rover people would never lower themselves to such a level.